A great customer experience program does two things. And when you think about next year, let's make sure that you're checking off both of these things. One, it enables your people to follow up with individual customers or clients in some way, shape, or form. So there's an individual level to this. And then there's this level like that there's some systemic issue going on. There's a lot of people not understanding something. And when you can identify a systemic issue, that can have even a bigger impact because that touches lots and lots of customers when you make the change. Hey everyone, welcome to People Metrics Live. Today we're going to be helping you get your CX program ready for a great year in 2021 with some tips, tricks, and best practices from our team to yours. Let's kick it off. So what can CX professionals do now to prepare their CX programs for 2021? Wow, this has been such a year of change um, in the world and, and of CX. And I don't think there's, there's ever a better time, Audrey, than right now to start thinking about kind of where are you today and where you want to go as a company when measuring the customer experience. Yeah, I think it's it's so important. And I think what you really have to think about is why do you want CX to be a priority in 2021? Um, I think, you know, people may have gotten off track this year based on everything that's gone on. And as we're planning to move into next year, what are you going to do and why do you think CX should be a priority? I mean, I always think of CX um, as something that's absolutely vital for the company because it's a leading indicator of financial results and other outcomes. So you may have a customer who has been disappointed a couple times. They give you a two or three out of 10 on your net promoter score. So they're a detractor. You might not see them leave today, but it's a, it's a leading indicator that they're, they're vulnerable and may leave in the future. And they may tell other people about their poor experience, right? So, you know, I always say that CX is a vital function of the enterprise. Um, I think that's becoming more and more mainstream, that th line of thinking. And really put it, getting your ducks in a row to figure out kind of what are you going to do in 2021 to improve the customer experience, measure it, get people the data they need to make those changes to improve the customer experience. There's really no other activity that could be more important than that. Yeah, I think now's really the time that you need to take stock of what happened this year, what worked, what didn't work. Um, if there are things that are not working for you, that think about them and plan for, for making the change moving into next year. Um, I think 2021 is going to look very different than, than this year, but even from, from our normal before this year happened, I think 2021 is going to look different. There's so many things that have changed from the way that consumers interact with companies um, to, to things have gone digital that weren't digital in the past. And you really have to look around and think about how are we going to make the best of all these changes next year? And I think, Audrey, was the first thing, if, you, you know, if you're sitting in the audience or listening to this, have you made any changes to your CX program? And we say CX program, we mean reaching out to customers to understand what their experience is, either sort of overall with the relationship you have with them or specific touch points. Like, you know, when they buy from you, when your customer calls your, your, your support center, when they get a delivery, what is their experience like? And are you consistently measuring that experience by asking the customer how it was? And are you distributing those results to your team so they can take action on those results to improve the experience over time? Right, so the first thing I would ask, right, Audrey, is have you made any changes, cutbacks? You know, have you paused your program? You know, what's going on with it right now? Um, yeah, you, uh, you may have touch points that, that you weren't, um, that didn't exist before. You may have touch points that have grown in, in use so that you might not have measurement. I think what, Sean, what you said is important. Consistency is key. You need to look at these things over time. Um, it's great right. to get a snapshot of what's happening, but if, if things have changed, you need to make sure that um, you're consistently uh, measuring that experience so that you can take action and, and, and improve it for your customers. So listen, I, this has been an extraordinary year in all, in all cases, like no one could ever have predicted this year. And there may have been some things that you needed to cut back on as a team um, if you're watching this, and maybe you have a few programs on pause. But I would, I would urge you to rethink that um, as we look towards next year, you know, given it's a leading indicator, given it's something that if you manage it, you can really impact things like churn, like, like positive word of mouth, et cetera. You know, I often argue that, that not measuring the customer experience is like not counting your money, right? So unlikely that finance and accounting departments have been removed. I would argue that, that it's just as important because the, these experiences your customers and clients have are 
are predicting those future cash flows. Um, and it's extremely important to get a handle on it. Um, that being said, looking towards next year, we could be looking at, a, at something that we've never seen before, a you know, pent-up demand in almost all sectors or people who want to, ex to have more experiences, different experiences, things that they've put off buying, trips they've, they've put off going on, you know, all those things. We talked about this a little bit a couple of days ago, right, Audrey? And, yeah. you know, are you prepared for such a thing? Um, and it could be it could be the it could be wild times once vaccines are 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 distributed next year and people wanting to customers wanting to do things more things. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I think we got um, pretty good news about the vaccines, and it sounds like hopefully by mid year next year a good part of the population will be vaccinated. And I think well, I agree with what you said, Sean, that people are going to be just like can't wait to get out and doing things. Um, and, and I still think it's gonna look different than it was before. I think um, the, the culture of having things delivered and not spending time shopping or, or things like that in person is likely gonna change, but people are really gonna be hungry for things where they can connect with other people and, and have experiences. And I think if you are in a business where any of that will happen, that you have to be measuring those experiences um, so that you know what's going on with your customers and can keep doing the things that you're doing well and then make changes where you need to, to improve the experience. Right. I mean, I've, I've read something that the digitization of the economy has compressed in nine months what probably was gonna take five to 10 years, right? So there has been that change. And as you said, Audrey, we probably are going to see some trends continue no matter what happens in 2021. Hi, it's Madeline. Thanks for joining us for People Metrics Live. If this is your first time watching, People Metrics Live is a weekly live webinar session where experts from our team answer your questions about customer, employee, and patient experience measurement and management. We've been doing this for almost two decades now, and this is a great way for us to share our knowledge with you. You can sign up for upcoming sessions at www.peoplemetrics.com slash events and bring a friend. So if you're, if you're, what advice can we give the audience in terms of their planning for 2021 or where would you begin if you were them um, in making, in making these plans? Yeah. So I think the first thing is to look at what you are doing and what is still mm -hmm. working and what, what do you want to keep? So don't, you know, if it's not broken, you don't have to get rid of it. But once you do that and you decide what's still working, then look at what has changed. And, and for things that have changed, your, your touch points have changed. Um, are you measuring all your touch points? Have you done touch point mapping? Are you really looking at the customer journey and you know where people are coming to you, where, where you're, they're touching your company? Um, and take stock of all that and then um, you know, kind of revamp your customer experience program going into next year and take that all into account. Yeah, I don't think there's ever been a better time than right now to do a, a, a touch point mapping, journey mapping exercise. And what that really entails is understanding and identifying every point that a, that a customer interacts with you. And, you know, I often recommend doing that even before they become a customer. So understanding what, what the digital experience is, most likely looking at your website, if, even if they're a prospect, right, and understanding that understanding what the experience is to buy from you. If, if depending on what kind of business you have, maybe you have salespeople, so you understand what that experience is, or maybe it's purely a digital piece where, where, where customers are signing up on the website, understand what that experience is. And then once they start experiencing your product or service, then obviously you wanna to start to understand that. And, and your support system, right, Audrey, a lot of our programs are heavily involved in support. And that, that, that really yeah. makes or breaks the customer experience. So has your support changed? Have you shifted from contact center to more online chat? You know, are there, are there different mixes of that? And it's a really good time to look at that and see and try to figure out what are those touch points? What are those transactions look like? And how do you want the customer to feel and experience at each one of them? Yeah, and I think once you, you get get where you need to be as far as your touch points and you have to make sure that you're asking the right questions so we talk yeah. about mps a lot here and i think that you have to use it but it's not really a great indicator of of the last experience that a person yeah. had it's more of a relationship measure so then you have right. to make sure that you're asking the questions to measure the, the the most recent transaction how did it go um and for all your touch points and i think what a lot of people had maybe been doing was was overlooking or not giving enough weight to that digital experience. And that's, that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest shifts that I've seen this year. 
that the digital touch point is is much more important than it might have been in the past. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about how customer experience is a leading indicator of financial results earlier. When you're asking questions about a touch point, like let's say a, a customer calling your contact center, right? Or visiting your store, if you have a store or whatever it is. The thing about it is if you are just asking NPS, that's really like an overall, like you said, it's an overall accumulation of all of your past experiences in one. So you could have a, um, an experience, say, where you're buying on one of your favorite e-commerce sites, right? And you've been doing, you've been going there for a long time. You've been buying, buying from them from for forever, right? And, you know, the last experience was not great. But when you're asked the net promoter score, you're you're considering your whole relationship. So you're still a promoter. But if you're not asking about what that most recent experience is, you're not getting that leading indicator. I would say of net promoter score. So if we ask. On your most recent experience, how, how satisfied are you, for example, on a one to five scale, and you have a two there, and you consistently, two meaning not good, and you have another one and it's just like that, you might see your net promoter score fall off a cliff um, if not acted upon beforehand. Yeah, I mean, and in that example, and it's a great one, that, that's a customer that has been coming back to your company time and time again, and then they're having a bad experience. You, you want to know about that, and just asking NPS isn't going to capture it. So it's, it's really important that you're asking the right questions. So I think best practice, at least what we think of it these days, is ask a net promoter score first, ask, ask why, so enable them to have a qualitative answer, open-ended response afterwards, and then ask specifically on your most recent experience, how satisfied are you with that experience? And that way you're getting that too. And then we often go into problem, right? Because problems are a really important question, we think, in in any kind of post-transactional touch point type work. Absolutely. Yeah. You have, you have to give respondents the chance to tell you if they had a problem. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, not that we want to be negative all the time, but if somebody had a problem, you need to know about it. And I think one of the most important things um, is, is to ask what, what was the category of that problem? And you yeah. can have people self-select, meaning you can give them a list of things that it could have been related to and have them choose. And it makes it really easy for you to zero in on where your problems might be occurring. And the beauty is if there's no problem, they skip a bunch of questions. But exactly. if, there, if there is a problem, you want to know, yes, they had a problem. Like you said, we want to know how it's categorized. We want to know in their own words what happened. So another open-ended text box where, where people are free form text. And we also recommend asking, was this problem resolved, right? And so you know kind of where you stand with that customer with regard to that problem. And, and, and those are very, very important questions to be asking. Yeah, we always recommend that you should use an alert on the problem question. So if people said they have a problem, that you should trigger an alert and send a notification directly to someone with you. You can close the loop with that respondent, reach out to them and talk about what their problem was, make sure they were able to resolve it and that they have everything they need to feel satisfied. What other questions would you recommend, um, Audrey, that people include at, at, sort of as a, as a must have in some of these programs? Yeah, I always like to recommend a recognize question where you ask if anybody went in b- above and beyond in, in the interaction to meet this person's needs. Um, Especially at this time of year, there's lots of customer service calls happening related to orders being sent out, people are sending gifts, and and you want to know if you have an employee who's going above and beyond, especially if there may be a seasonal employee, this would give you information to say, hey, this is someone that's important to my organization, I think I should keep them on. Um, And it boosts morale with your employee population when you can turn around and say, look, we're asking this question, we want to know who's doing a great job for our customers, and then we're turning around and we're using that within our organization and sharing it with you. Yeah, so we typically recommend asking a question, just a simple yes, no question. Did anybody go above or beyond or provide an exceptional experience during your most recent transaction? If it's yes, we ask, do you remember the associate's name? And can you tell us a little bit about what they did? So you can then have in their own, in the customer's own word, something you can share with people and clients can take that to, to the next level and, you know, count up 
who has the most recognition alerts. You could have awards based on this and everything. Did you know that you can watch past sessions of People Metrics Live right here on our YouTube channel? Be sure to check them out for answers to dozens of questions, along with stories, tips, and best practices from our team of experts. Click the bottom right corner of this video to subscribe to our channel so you never miss an update. The only other question I can think of that I see people asking that is probably something maybe that the folks who are listening today may not consider is if you have other products and services that you offer, we have had success with including that in your survey too, to enable a customer or client to identify areas where you may be able to expand your relationship with them. And those, mm -hmm. that data would get sent to either a marketing or business development or sales team to follow up. And I think what, something you just said that's, that's important to consider is who's receiving this data within your organization, yeah. who has access to it, and then, and then what is the process? How, what do they do with it once they have it? You know, it's one thing to set an NPS goal and say, okay, here's our goal and here's our number, here's where we are. But when you're asking these types of questions with what kind of problem did you have or are you recognizing someone or what other products and services did you want, there's specific people who should be receiving that and then know what to do with it. You have to have a really good process in place to handle the feedback that you're getting. Right, and, that, and that's another, I think, important point in planning for 2021 is making sure that this customer experience initiative is not siloed, right? So it's an organizational wide initiative and when you share customer feedback with the entire company and empower people to use that, you all of a sudden become a customer centric culture for real, right? That's, that's, yeah. that's not a corporate platitude or on some wall, that's real life customer centricity in action. And we had a few different examples now of questions. So net promoter score is often thought of as an executive metric. So executives yeah. tend to like to see that, right? Um, of course, yeah. But, but that might not be all net promoter score is good for. I was sharing, I think, a story earlier today, Audrey, of a client who, who takes the promoters from net promoter score. Those are people who, sit, who recommend the company out of a 9 or 10, out of a 10-point scale. And this is in a B2B context, but those clients who said 9s or 10s got sent to the sales team. And the sales team followed up with a thank you for your business. And a ask for a referral. Yeah, Motors, that's by a definition. great use of, of MPS. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. So you yeah. already know that they, they, they think positively about your company. Yeah. What, why aren't you digging into that? And so let's go down the line. Where do where does the problem data typically go to if if customer has a problem? Where do you see that being most useful? A lot of people who are using problem and detractors who score zero to six on the NPS yeah. scale that they're reaching out to just to say we're so sorry that you didn't have a great experience and and how can we help you? Sometimes that's a customer service team where it's centralized and they're dealing with it. Sometimes for our location based business, it might be a branch manager or a general manager of the location who handles that. But I had a client tell me about a new way they started using it. They have a customer closeness initiative that they're doing um, where they have executives actually reading survey responses based on their department. And so this client had set up auto billing, which sounds great. People can could opt in to be auto billed and the numbers looked really good about who was opting in. They had seen a big spike. I think they were giving a, a, an incentive for X percent off your bill if you opted into auto billing. And then they started seeing more detractors. And the executive in charge of this initiative started digging into those comments to see what was going on. And it turns out that it was taking three billing cycles for the auto billing to kick in. So people were signing up for the auto billing and then they were still being billed and then they weren't paying because they thought that it was auto billing. And it was a, a, you know, a comedy of miscommunications when everybody thought that everything was doing fine. So this executive read these comments and was like, I can't believe this is happening he went to the billing team and said, what's going on? And they said, oh yeah, it says it takes three billing cycles. What's the problem? And because of this whole miscommunication, they were getting detractors when they thought they were making people happy, but he was able to read this and like in a two week period had everything resolved and, and pretty quickly saw their MPS respond when people were not having that problem anymore. So it really can make a difference when you pay attention to what your customers are saying. That's a great example. And we talked about if you have a questions around expanding your relationship, that could go to sales. So sales can be touched. We talked about NPS yeah. going to sales. And the recognition piece 
is something that can go, that can be an HR piece, that can be a manager touch. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who has people working for them, working with them, it's, it's, a, it's a natural. So, you know, we're touching all parts of the organization if done really well, a, a customer experience program consistently throughout the year. It, it's, it's a powerful, powerful thing when, when done right. Yeah, um, really useful data when you take advantage of what you're getting. So just before we move on to the next topic, a great customer experience program does two things, right? And, and when you think about next year, let's make sure that you're checking off both of these things. One, it enables your people to follow up with individual customers or clients in some way, shape or form. A lot of times that's because they've had a problem or they're a detractor. So you need a process in place in order to follow up with those people. Like Audrey said, maybe that's a centralized function where there's a couple, there's several dedicated people who do that. Maybe it's decentralized where you're allowing the people who are actually talking to the customer or responsible for the customer every day to follow up. But either way, they should follow up. This should be documented and marked. And there should be a systematic process to save that customer, reduce their likelihood of negative word of mouth. So there's an individual level to this. And that also could be around following up or a recommendation or it could be expanding your relationship. So there's an individual level. And then there's this level like you were talking about before, Audrey, that there's some systemic issue going on. There's a lot of people not understanding something like it takes three cycles for the bill paid to, to, to be enacted. And when you can identify a systemic issue, that can have even a bigger impact because that touches lots and lots of customers when you make the change for, for the better. So those are, those are two things I always tell people to keep in mind. And when you're looking at 21, let's make sure your program enables both. Yeah, and make sure you're prepared to, to handle both, um, that you're willing to, to put in the time to respond to those individual people who are telling you things, and that if you discover something that's org-wide, that, that you're willing to make the change. Out of doubt. Our founder and CEO, Sean, wrote an amazing book about customer experience measurement called Listen or Die, 40 Lessons That Turn Customer Feedback into Gold. It's a deep dive into best practices for CX measurement based off of his years of experience in the space, and you can easily read it front to back on an airplane ride. Be sure to check it out. It's available now on Amazon. Now, what else do we want to cover during this People Metrics Live? Yeah, so I'm, I'm just looking at some questions here that have come in, and uh, I've got one here that says, what changes are you seeing people make to their programs moving into the new year? Yeah, I think the digitization of the economy is what's making changes. So whereas, you know, a digital feedback piece may have been a nice to have in January of 2020, it's a must have in January 2021, meaning getting people's feedback off of websites, apps, things like that, understanding their experience, understanding what's good and what's not, what could be improved. That, that seems to be a big change that we're seeing. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say something similar, but it's, it's to make sure that you're not missing those digital touch points that have become so important over the last year and I think will continue to be moving through next year and beyond. And the other thing I'd point to is just the way that we collect feedback is now 100% digital where you know the days of, of customers touching things is pretty much over. So when I say touching things, you know, old school would be a paper survey. Those you might think, well, nobody does those anymore. Well, if a lot of people had been doing those, you know, at They're hotels and, yeah. and yeah. restaurants. But that just, you know, nobody wants to do that anymore because for obvious reasons. And anything, anything they have to touch in terms of a kiosk or an iPad, that's pretty much, that's very difficult right now. And it's probably going to continue to be in 2021, I would guess. So the more that you can prepare to get a opt-in from your customers to get customer feedback from them, and this may be part of your marketing too, that's often combined, that's, that's a huge thing that you can work on next, for, for next year also. So making sure that digital experiences are enabled to be captured and non-digital experiences through opt-in both email and SMS, right? So mobile phone numbers are absolutely vital going forward. We're seeing more and more clients request this, right, Audrey, in terms of let's get a survey out Instead of email, let's send the link via a text. Yeah, and there's a couple pieces to that. We've had clients come and say, hey, we want to do this. And then they realize that they don't have or are not capturing mobile phone numbers across their customer base. So one thing is to make sure that you have a system to capture both 
mobile number and email address. Yes. And then are you asking people how they want to communicate with you? Some people will, will want email forever, but other people yeah. will be texted. And so in that opt-in, I think something that we're seeing some clients do is ask, how do you want us to communicate with you? What do you prefer? And, and it could be, it could be multifaceted for, you know, my hotel reservation and my check-in code, I want to be texted, but for updates on promotions, I want to be emailed and you'll have to decide what makes the most sense. But I think asking people what they prefer and then making sure that you have all those contact information for each customer is going to be key. You know, Madeline, one of the chapters in my book, Listen or Die, that may not seem very fun to read, but is an important chapter is you have to interact with IT to really get these programs running. And what we're talking about now is an example of that, right? So IT has got to be your friend and you need to be able to understand how to interact with them in a way that you can receive these opt-in emails and texts are the new email. I remember talking to clients five or six years ago, 10 years ago about email and people are like, well, we have, we have their phone number, at, we have their home phone number. And that's what we can do. We can call them. And we're like, well, no, you have to get opt-in email. Now it's, yeah, we have their opt-in email. You have to start the process of getting their mobile number so you can text them surveys or however you want to correspond with them. That would be one of my top priorities for most of our clients and any company thinking about doing such a thing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think that that chapter on IT is is a great one. I'm looking at another question here before we wrap up. We've just got one more, which is if you could do one thing as your first CX related action in 2021, what would we recommend that action be? What do you think, Audrey? It's hard to say because it depends where you are in your program, yeah. I think. But I would make sure that you're you're not missing a touch point. I think that's if that's the biggest takeaway from today is make sure that you have really done the work to understand your customer's journey and and are not missing a touch point that you're measuring across. I totally agree with that. I, I'll throw out another one. No matter how big or small a company you are, if you're not taking action on individual customer responses that's where I would begin. Because these programs can pay for themselves if you reduce churn on a lifetime, a customer has a lifetime value above a certain level. So I would make sure that your, you know, relationship surveys are great. When I say relationship surveys, those are surveys that you send out to all of your customers or clients to get a general idea of what your relationship is, usually through NPS, and really all the different ways that you may interact with them at a high level. And they're great, but they should be, supplemented and, and, and include another type of survey that we've been talking a lot about today. And that's a post-transactional or post-experience survey where you're really honing in on a touch point and you're able to react positively. And this should be key touch points, right? You shouldn't set up a measurement program unless it was super important to your customer. But if it is, then set up a mechanism where you can follow up when there are problems because it can save you not only the churn of this customer, you can save them from telling the data is 10 to 12 people are shared a negative experience versus two to three with a positive one, right? And then with the, mm -hmm. with like this crazy Reddit and, and Yelp and everything, you could be sharing it with in Facebook, you could be sharing it with millions of people if it ever caught on. So it's, you can't underestimate that piece. Yeah, definitely. I, I think both of those points are great and, and uh, great tips for first things to, to look at as you're going into 2021. I love what you were saying, just about taking a look at touch points and how, the, you know, when the vaccine comes, that there'll likely be that floodgate of people wanting to go out and do the things that they used to do. But with this new mentality of everything that's happened in 2020, what used to be your normal retail shopping experience might have different things that are important to your customer. Right. Then. I mean, I, I think, Madeline, will restaurants ever hand out menus again? Or will it be one of those one of those codes that you're now able to put in your phone and then look at the menu? Like, are things like that going to stay? Have you thought out those things? Are you reducing the number of things that people are touching because whether or not it's safe to do so people's behaviors changed and their mentality has changed right. and their their expected experience is probably evolving and if you're not getting customer feedback you're you are flying blind on this 
I mean, seriously, it's a minor, minor investment compared to the ROI you can get from some of the things that I think we, we shared today. And fortunately, it's becoming more mainstream. You know, we've been doing this 20 years, as Madeline has been saying. Uh, it wasn't always the case that customer feedback was something everybody did, but most people are considering it at some level now. Yes, exactly. And people, customers are eager to give their feedback now as well. So <laughs> thank you guys both, um, Sean and Audrey, for this great conversation about our recommendations and guidelines for how you can plan for your CX program in 2021. And hey, thank you for joining us for People Metrics Live. If you liked this video, make sure you subscribe right here so you never miss an update. Have you checked out other sessions of People Metrics Live yet? Click right here to watch them all. I'll see you there.